Welcome back to another episode of Awkward Insurance. Hey, whoa. Ashley. Excuse you. Are you actually doing an intro right now? You didn't even want to do this when your husband came on. The intro is my part. I know, I know. It typically, I you know I wanted to let you handle it, but it must be a full moon or something. Today's <laughs> today's episode had me inspired, so let me let me all start right, again. Right. Don't interrupt me this time. Let me mute myself. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Awkward Insurance, where most of the time we talk about insurance, but all of the time it ends up being awkward, just like the opening did. So, Dustin, how do you feel like you're doing at this whole hashtag adulting thing? Listen, a lot of times when people ask me how my kids are, my answer is they're alive. Is that enough? Hey, that's fair. (laughs) With three kids and one teenager and nearly a 20 year marriage, I think I'm killing it. And I'm pretty dang proud of the career that I can look back on. But zero out of 10, do I recommend adulting to anybody because adulting is kind of aggressive. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I, I feel that. I mean, I'd like to think I've done pretty well so far, you know, like buying cars and navigating a chronic illness and budgeting. Like I've got it all together. I could go to the doctor and not have to call my mom with questions like you see on TikTok and Instagram. So I'm, I'm doing good. That's it. I'm really proud right now that the car that I'm driving is the longest I have owned a car without, and now I won't say without wanting to trade it in because I have wanted to trade it in, but I have resisted trading it in. That's a big, <laughs> I'm proud of you. But I mean, the I think the thing that scared me the most all the time was buying a house just because A, I know nothing about the process and it's kind of like insurance. People don't understand insurance. Well, I don't understand how to buy a house and just the investment aspect of it and all I hate owing people things. So I know it's a normal thing and everybody gets a mortgage, but it terrified me. So while buying a house was a terrifying thought for me, my realtor and everybody involved that he brought in made this literally one of the easiest things that my husband and I ever did. I can guarantee you, if you want to know the story, reach out to me separately, that it probably never goes this easy. It was probably a total fluke. But Thomas made this incredibly easy. He has been in real estate development and sales for the last decade. Prior to becoming a licensed salesperson in 2016, he was a project manager for Ohio University. Thomas is the broker and co-owner of Westwood Real Estate Company located in Columbus, Ohio. And Westwood Real Estate prides themselves in being trusted advisors. There we go, insurance agents. Trusted advisors and creating (laughs) lasting relationships with the people they work with. So, Thomas, thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to Awkward Insurance. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Did I miss anything in your bio? No, I think that covered it. All right, perfect. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Was one of our, like, was our sale or purchase, I guess, like one of the easiest ones ever? Because it felt very easy from our end. I'm trying to remember. How many homes did we, did we look at? Do you remember? One. We looked at one. That is a (laughs) very easy. uh, Oh my gosh. When we bought this house, I think we looked at no fewer than 15 in a very wide area because we were very limited in the area and where we wanted to stay. So we had to broaden our search. And even still, it was like the heat of the summer. I think we bought this one in in August of a year. So we were looking through July and practically nobody wanted to run their air conditioner. So every house I went in, we were all sweating. And when we walked into this one that we're in now, which was very, again, very limited market in our area, the AC was on. So it immediately got me emotional. And I was like this, I'm good with this one. Can we stop now? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> And I'll do it. I will share that that is fairly abnormal. I would say on average, every client's different, but on average, I'm helping people shop for homes between two and four months. But there's some instances like yourself, people that are hyper-focused know exactly what they want. um, And it only takes one time out showing a home. Or there's been some clients that I've worked with for two plus years where I've shown hundreds of homes and gone out 50 plus times. Why do I feel like those people are just jerking you around though? Two (laughs) years and they haven't said yes yet. I feel like they're just bored. So they require some coaching, right? So they require some coaching and narrowing their focus, right? So Ashley kind of knew exactly what she wanted and that kind of made that process as far as identifying a potential property more easy. Than, than folks that 
don't know Columbus, don't know the neighborhoods, don't know whether or not they want a fenced in backyard in the suburbs or want to be downtown. And sometimes it requires showing them multiple homes in different areas, right? So each case is is different. Each experience is unique. Ashley, can you imagine on the insurance side of things, two to four years of somebody saying, can you quote this home for me? No, I mean, I'm I'm thinking about how many times people went car shopping and they're like, here's a VIN number. Here's another VIN number. I'm like, how about we just wait until you're really serious about it? Right. But I mean, especially in today's insurance market, it'd be like, all right, well, I need to know how old the roof is and the utility, like every single time. I'd be like, okay, you call me when you put an offer in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then yeah. we'll talk about the insurance. <laughs> So another thing, too, is um, sometimes it takes a while to build trust with clients, right? If they've just met me for the first time, um, sometimes it takes folks a while to get to know me and kind of understand the process. And sometimes that that takes writing offers that are unsuccessful, right? Maybe I provide coaching of like, hey, this is a hot area. It's going to go asking price. We've got to discuss potentially offering an appraisal gap, a high earnest money deposit up front. And sometimes folks will hear me out, but not necessarily move forward with that coaching um, and have to experience the market themselves. And sometimes it takes two, three times of unsuccessful offers before they catch on and get it. And then, you know, the fourth time out uh, when they find that home for them, their understanding of the market conditions we're in and the areas they're looking for and willing to write that offer that's going to be accepted. Right. Yeah, that's. That's definitely what I appreciated because obviously there was already that level of trust there. So I knew whatever you're telling me, you weren't BSing me by any means and I could trust what you're saying, but it also helped in me feeling more comfortable to ask questions because, you know, we had put in an offer with a cap and we lost it. And then the next two offers fell through. So then I said, at that point, my heart was already broken because we lost it the first time, but we were not thinking about it anymore. And I remember coming back to you as I was driving down to North Carolina to pick up Steve. And I said, hey, just for the heck of it, put in an offer 20000 lower than asking price. And I mean, you handled that well. You didn't like scoff at it, but you said, well, maybe let's go like a little higher. And it, it all ended up working out. But like, I can imagine looking back and like, man, I probably shouldn't have done that. It was being a little aggressive. But, you know, you coaching me and saying, well, this is where I think they want to be. And this is what we should do. And that'd probably be more successful. And look, it all worked out. You'd be surprised as far as getting that information. It's it's communication with a listing agent, right? So I will share with you, there's some folks in this industry that just don't pick up the phone and call the listing agent to understand the demand of the property. You know, how many showings did they have over this weekend? How long have they been on market? Do they have offers? And some listing agents, if they have permission from the seller, can disclose the offer terms and conditions by simply just asking if you're representing a buyer and on the buy side, right? So Making that call, developing rapport with a listing agent, understanding the demand for the property, and then coming back and sharing that coaching, that information with my client saying, hey, you know, they've got they've got three offers, their asking price is three hundred. We've got to be three twenty-five if we want to be competitive. And at the end of the day, I put that decision in my client's hands, right? Like, are you comfortable with 325? If not, let's let's move on. Let's look for a different property because this one right now has has a lot of demand in the bid bid situation. Or I get clients that are like, let's go get this one. And so then you're calling the listing agent back saying, hey, I know you've got three other offers on the table. Uh, my client's willing to go higher. And what I try to do is see if I go higher than the highest offer on the table currently, if that listing agent will present that offer this evening that I write and to get their sellers to accept that night so that it doesn't drag out on Saturday and then open house Sunday. And then, you know, you're competing against with a half dozen more offers than you don't want yeah. to, right? So it, I think communication is key, developing rapport, having a good industry reputation. Um, you've been around a while, you know, agents, sometimes you, you've seen them two or three times on the other side of the deal. So all of that is important for setting your client up for success. So let's talk about branding because you're saying, you know, building rapport or being well known or, or being seen. And that's something that I know personally insurance agents struggle with because a lot of people, I was one of those people when I was in our family agency, we couldn't handle the referrals that were coming through the front door, which we were very fortunate. However, 
I'm the first person to say that if I go and you say, hey, Ashley, go and check out this business and I Google them and they don't have a web page or a Google listing, they might be the best company or person in the world, but why don't they exist online? So I really have to trust somebody to go and talk to someone that doesn't exist online somewhere. So that being said, you have incredible branding on Instagram. I was cracking up um, for Thank all you. the millennials out there. Your one video that had, was it Creed with arms wide open? With arms wide open. Yes. That's right. Loved it. I loved it. Um, I just, Steve was going crazy and sent it to me. So that being said, like, how did you start your brand? Like what, what got you set on that track? How you do what you do? Like what has led to your success? Yeah. So you're talking about search engine optimization, right? And so how can, because nowadays, you know, 2024, folks before they start working with someone are going to Google that person, right? And so how can you enhance that experience when they Google your name for you to pop up and have going with you? So a couple things. First is every client I work with, I work really hard for, I give 110%. And then after I, I'm successful, hopefully with that client and get them to the closing table, I request a five-star review, right? So as a realtor, there's a number of different websites that a lot of people use. Um, I've got my Google business page. I've got Zillow. I've got realtor.com. And then I've got my Facebook uh, business page. So I request that all clients that have had a good experience with me post the same review in all four different websites. Again, with the goal to optimize your search engine optimization. So that's first. That's a big ask to get them to post across four different platforms. Is there, Are there any... I mean, like we've got a big focus on intertech. Is there any real estate tech that helps cross those reviews? No, I send them links. Oh. To four, four different links. Copy and, and paste. Like two, <laughs> two or three different clicks. And I will share with you, there's probably room, room for improvement there because some clients get through the Google business page and just ignore the, the, the three other websites that I request for them to post. But the ones that are a little more tech savvy will we'll do all four. But the whole goal and the whole purpose is to try to be well known throughout a number of different platforms, right? Some folks will search for me on Zillow and not go to my Google business page. So I'm just trying to, again, get as many five-star reviews across different platforms that my clients or prospective clients are, are going to. So that's that's number one. And then you don't have to go far to see my creativeness when it comes to listing a property for sale. It is one of my favorite things to do in this industry, and I love it. Every property is different, and the creative juices start flowing when I'm walking that property for the first time of if I'm going to get the listing, how am I going to market it? So I'll give you a couple of examples. I had a listing out of Buckeye Lake, which is a lake 45 minutes east of Columbus, and uh, it's, it was only a 900-square-foot, two-bedroom, one-bath, Cape Cod, super small but it was on mm -hmm. water. So of course, what did I do? I rented a jet ski and I did the video intro from a jet ski with the house behind me, right? Because there wasn't too much to showcase about this 900 square foot home. But what I did do was sell the lake, lake lifestyle, right? Of like what it's like to live on Buckeye Lake. I, uh, we did B-roll uh, lifestyle shots at the winery nearby. And I had a lot of, a lot of fun with that. Um, so that's just an example of what makes a property unique. How can I creatively market this to get it? There's an end goal here. As much exposure as as possible. Because the more exposure, the more people know. The more people know, the more scheduled showings we have. The more scheduled showings we have, the more offers we have. The more offers we have increases the net for my sellers, right? And so, you know, we're talking about brand. So it's it's definitely customer service, it's being accessible, it's having experience coaching my clients through the process, but then I love having fun with marketing. So video marketing and then posting it across platforms to get as much exposure as possible. And that's, that's your resume in real estate is someone's going to go to my Instagram page and see if I'm likable enough for them to want to reach out, DM me, work yeah. with me, right? So that's essentially my resume. It's no longer a one pager. It's uh, what video did I post and is the content that I'm producing, you know, easy, easy to follow and, and worthwhile. I feel like I'm old school. Why is that? For my, well, for my realtor, it's, it's, it's well, I have a solid realtor now, but I remember when looking for a realtor, if I even considered choosing a different realtor, 
I'm going with trusted word of mouth from a friend. Who did you use? Why did you like them? And I mean, I might look at some pictures of how they've marketed a house, but I'm, I don't know. I'm like a, let me ask, let me book and get it done. (laughs) But what if you're the first of your friends that are buying a house? Okay. When I purchased my first house, it was literally the sign that was out in front of the first house. I called that realtor and was like, I'm interested in the house. And he was part of a brokerage. So somebody Mm -hmm. else represented the buyer or the seller, I guess. And she became our realtor and then referred us to our insurance agent because I wasn't in insurance at the time, like forever ago. I don't know. I just had blind faith, I guess. Old school blind faith. Yes, sign calls are a way to get business. If you got a listing, some folks are unrepresented and will call the listing agent directly. But you're talking about referrals, which uh, I would say that's 90% of my business. So I've never okay. used for a lead. I like the, re- never- let's, let's stop for a second on the, the marketing branding here. Let's go with referrals because referrals are a huge crossover into insurance as well. Where do you get your largest source of referrals from? I would say sphere of influence, right? uh, Friends and family, and then also industry partners, right? So um, I've been in this industry long enough where I've got a solid two or three lenders that I work with consistently that I send business if my client's looking for a lender and vice versa. If someone reaches out to them first to kind of understand their budget, to see what they would be pre-approved for, I get leads from industry partners as well. Who are your industry partners? Can you list cat, like categories of industry partners? Yeah. So you've got you've got lenders, you've got title companies, you've got insurance agents. <laughs> the best ones. But you gotta say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> insurance agents. I'd say those are my top three. But then I've got, you know, real estate attorneys. Um, and some that that shoot me business just occasionally, but I would say those would be my my top three, top four of where I get business. Do you ever get any business from like inspectors? I have not. Now, if there is one person in this equation to not trust, it's the in, it's the inspector. <laughs> I have had the worst luck with inspectors, and now I don't know who or what to trust when it comes to choosing a house. You got to find a good one. I've got. But how I've do you know? One. Well through time and doing multiple deals with, with that inspector. So the inspector, so in our industry, you have to refer three people in each industry uh, without being in violation. And so I refer three different, three different inspectors, but the one that's most commonly chosen who has the best online presence and who who I've done the most deals with, uh, he's probably done 70 or 80 different home inspections for me. He's fantastic. He shows up on time. Um, he knows everything about homes. He's done thousands of home inspections. He's communicative. He knows how to communicate with clients. And so what I do with my home inspectors, I always encourage my client and myself to show up 30 minutes to 60 minutes before he completes his home inspection for us to do a walkthrough with him to talk about things that are going to appear on the inspection report, right? So Typically, the you know the average three bedroom, two and a half bedroom bathroom home with two thousand square feet would take about three hours. I tell my clients to arrive in that last hour for us to do a walkthrough with that inspector because inspections can be overwhelming and daunting, especially if you're a first time home buyer. Some of the inspections that I've gotten back are 100, 200, 250 pages long. Right? Can I clarify when you say your clients? Are you talking about the buyer, or the seller, or both? Buyer. Okay, thank you. Yeah, when I'm working with a buyer, because it can be daunting because the buyer in the situation is the one that's paying for the home inspection. They've gotten their offer accepted. And they've got, you know, seven to 10 days to get a home inspection. So they're the ones paying for it, hiring the home ins- home inspector. And so that's who I'm encouraging to get the, the home inspection. Then we do the walkthrough because, like I said, it can be quite overwhelming if you're a first time home buyer and you get a hundred page report and you're like, oh, my gosh, this house how's it still standing? Right. <laughs> so That's so true. <laughs> my home inspector does a good job of highlighting the, the, the significant issues and then discussing what it looks like to resolve some of those issues. And he does a very good job. And actually, I can't remember, did we, did we have a home inspection on, on property and did we use um, So it wasn't someone? with you. So what happened was the two that fell through 
they had already gotten a home inspection done and I asked That's to right. see it. And then I was happy. Well, I mean, I was as happy as I could be with it because I know in the area that I live, most homes have lath and plaster and they have some remnants of knob and tube wiring. So of course there were all of those like little red flags on there. However, it was very yep. well done. But if I wasn't aware of what to look for because of an insurance background, that would have been terrifying. Like it was like, oh, there might be, there could be moisture in the basement. But like, I know there's not because she paid 10 grand to fix the basement. And it's just like, there could be a, a minimal amount of moisture and everything is fine. But it could be overwhelming when you're reading it. Yep. And so, you know, that instance is a little bit unique, but I would say 90 to 95% of the time buyers are getting their own home inspection. And again, I'd say 75% of the time they're attending the last hour of a final walkthrough with the inspector, ask questions. I feel like that that helps everybody kind of understand the situation and what they're getting into if they're moving forward with purchasing the property. However, he's also killed plenty of deals for me because there's been things that have come up of like knob and tube wiring in the basement that's still active. You know, the roof is at the end of its life. The HVAC system is shot. That's not him killing the deal. That's the house killing the deal, Thomas. <laughs> that's the former owner not realizing they needed to do some maintenance before putting that house on the market, killing the deal. Yeah, but, but it also builds trust with that client because, you know, this home inspector is honest, transparent, like, hey, your uh, cinder block foundation walls are bowing in two and a half inches. The threshold's one before you need structural reinforcement. This entire wall that spans 30, 40 feet needs beams every two feet. Beams run about 600 bucks a piece. To solidify this, this, this wall, we're talking about $10,000, right. right? And so he's the type of person that can have those conversations. And at least my, my buyer is then informed. And again, if it, it's not the right house for them, we move on. And guess what? We built more trust because we're not in it just to try to get to the closing table. It's like, let's figure out what's going on with this home. And make sure it's right for you. Let's talk about another aspect that can kill your deal. Loan to value <laughs> ratio and insurance premium being included in that. Let, okay, so I, this is where I want to go with this. Let's talk about realtors kind of being an insurance adjacent professional to the insurance industry. Because after all, it's an insurance podcast. <laughs> so let's talk about ways we can work together. Um, what can an agent, it's, I'll tell you from my experience, Ashley, you chime in here as a personal lines insurance professional, sometimes realtors can be my worst nightmare because they'll get <laughs> into, he's like, really how, <laughs> because they'll get into having conversations with their client, or maybe they've got the buyer sheet on there or whatever. I'm not using the right terminology for the, for the realtor world. But it says estimated insurance cost. It's where you put the estimated um, utilities and you know everything that goes into that, which me as a skeptical individual, I'm like, all right, this water bill, all right, do you take five showers a day or do you take one shower a month? This electric bill, do you have five kids that leave the lights on all the time? Or do you refuse to use your AC as I've noticed when I've walked into homes and been sweating my booty off, whatever. But then there's this time where I get it as an insurance agent. It says estimated insurance costs $750 a year. And I want to go, you know what? You should find another realtor or another uh, a title agent or whatever, not title agent, but closing agent that puts those estimates on there or whatever, because that's laughable, especially today. That is laughable. If it's the prior insurance owner or the prior homeowner's insurance cost is $750, then it's probably because it's the first ever home insurance policy ever written and it's on a dwelling fire form and it has nothing on there that could actually cover the person. Oh my Anyways, goodness. I'll try to get off my soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> These are the ways that I've been offended <laughs> by, by the real estate transaction when it comes across my desk, because then I have to deliver, especially right now in this market, I have to deliver a 3000 maybe $4,000 price figure. My insurance right now costs $3,500 and I don't have claims on there. And so right. then the realtor will end up saying if there's this adversarial situation that happens where the realtor or the title agent, whoever it is, a uh, closing agent will say, oh, your insurance professional is off their rocker. And then the insurance professional is over here going, well, your real estate agent is off their rocker. <laughs> and it puts the client. 
client in the middle when they're already in this stressful home buying situation and they don't know who to trust or who not to trust or what to make of it. So let's talk about some things that realtors and insurance professionals can do to make each other's jobs easier, especially when it comes to not putting the client in the middle of this very tricky transaction of the loan to value ratio, that dadgum LTV. Yep. How about understanding costs before you write an offer? So I've got uh, a couple of insurance agents that, that I work with often. And so they develop estimates, right? And so I think having that conversation beforehand is is very important. Yeah. So for the folks listening, develop relationships with realtors and have conversations about what premiums are looking like, which I'm curious. Um, I'm sure it's a case-by-case basis depending on the condition of the home, the, the age of the home, uh, whether or not any updates have been done, uh, et cetera. So I think... Having good relationships with realtors is is important to kind of understand the 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 average premium, um, and then also letting folks know, having a, an open dialogue of, hey, we're writing an offer on one two three Main Street. It's a massive home. It's five bedrooms. It's forty five hundred square feet. It's got four and a half bathrooms. You know, what type of premium are we looking at? It was recently built in two thousand ten. I think um, having that conversation ahead of time is benefits everybody so that there's no surprises on the back end, right? Going into contract, thinking your policy is only going to be a thousand dollars a year and then getting stuck with 2,500 or something north of that. Yeah. I'll add in. And again, actually jump in whenever you want. But once I start talking, sometimes it's hard to interrupt me. I acknowledge that I'm working on it. (laughs) I'll add in though, but sometimes the insurance buying process or the transition process, if you will, because they may have already had an insurance relationship with their agent is not as simple as just the home that they're looking at. We're just like you say, your realtor advisors, we're insurance advisors, and we look at the client, not just the home. So it could include things that are additional coverages for maybe some business exposures that they have or recreational vehicles that are being covered for liability under their homeowner policy. We may need to consider some prior claims that they've had, and sometimes even the claims that have been on the home that they're purchasing can impact that. Once they apply for that loan, their credit ratio takes or their credit score takes a hit. And in some states, credit rating impacts what is known as the insurance score, which then makes that premium go higher. So there's a lot of different things on the insurance side that it's not just about, and let's get over the market value because the market value and the replacement cost of that home are not the same. Let's establish that real quick. (laughs) But there's so much more that goes into the insurance buying process that's included in that premium and making sure that they've got adequate coverage and not basic coverage, not minimal liability, not ACV on their replacement costs. You know, the the stuff that goes on with the roof right now, that's a huge issue in insurance all across the nation as to whether or not you can even get replacement costs on your roof. So there's so much more that goes into it than just looking at that that market value, um, how much the home costs. Yes, the the building characteristics are definitely a factor as well. I hope realtors understand that. <laughs> I, I think you're, you're alluding to a little bit of cost to value, right? So I think a lot of folks underestimate the cost to do renovations now, to renovate mm. a kitchen, to renovate a bathroom. Uh, the roof replacement costs, you know, everything over the last two to three years has skyrocketed in price. Um, there's little you can do to get the value out of something the, of, of the cost, right? So uh, I think I think a lot of folks underestimate the cost of material and the labor associated oh, for sure. with ripping off a roof and reinstalling one in 2024. Even specialized labor, when it comes to doing a brand new build, If you're doing a new build on a lot that doesn't have homes beside it yet, that cost to build it can sometimes be lower because you can use different equipment. But once you have homes beside it or other things you have to take into consideration, now you need specialty equipment to come in and not impede on other people's areas in order to, it's so even, I I mean, this is more of a client thing that usually works with a, a new home builder. They're like, it took 650000 to build this home. It's brand new. So that's what I want to insure it for. But maybe the replacement cost is coming in at seven fifty, 
or higher. Well, now it's because there's going to be some special. Not only is it not new materials anymore, we've got to match those materials. If only part of the home is damaged, we're not buying in bulk. We're buying in much smaller, you know, quantities of that. Lots of things that go into estimating that replacement cost value versus the um, the new uh, the purchase price. So let's let's switch gears here because I was thinking of something else, and I know we're coming towards the end of our typical time limit. So my question for you would be, what would, obviously you're good at branding, you're good at marketing, you're good at what you do, which is awesome. What would be the thing that would catch your attention? If an insurance agent wanted to create a relationship with a realtor, but they didn't, they didn't know one, maybe, you know, I knew everybody in our town, but our town didn't really have a realtor that wasn't related to me. So if I just wanted to go out to somebody that I didn't know, but I thought they were doing an awesome job, we could connect. What would get your attention? Because we get pitched for things all the time. I'm sure you do on LinkedIn too, stuff you're not even involved in. And they're like, hey, we have a job for you. And it's like, did you even look at my profile? Yeah, good question. I think a couple of things. We'll start at high level. High level, I think there's a lot of value in being local, right? Like having a local sphere. So uh, my, my first thought would be, you know, are, are you Ohio based? Are you Columbus based? And then what value can you add to, to me, to my brokerage, to my clients? So um, in being present, so I know my go-to insurance agent, he sponsors some of the events, client events that I do throughout the year. He's present for them. Um, so I think that's just the start, right? So being local, being present, and then he also has offered to do almost a, an information session with all the other agents at my brokerage to kind of to understand premiums better, to understand plans better. Ooh, I like that idea. So that's also a value add to kind of better understand the industry that you all work in. Awesome. And I'm, I'm also thinking like, you know, you have to come in to these relationship, relationships with like a giver's gain attitude because it's not just about, hey, Thomas, what can you send to me? It's also, you know, as we build relationships with people and we know somebody might be looking for a house in a different part of the state, then we could be saying, well, hey, if you don't have a realtor yet, here we go. This this is your person to call. So, I mean, we can always give back in that capacity as well. And, you know, even potentially, I'm sure agents can put it on their website. That'd be pretty awesome. Maybe I need to open an agency out here. Yeah. If you want... You you want to make a relationship with a realtor real quick, right. send them business. Ashley, can we open our own insurance <laughs> agency and just go ahead and co-brand it with Awkward? I mean, I, I don't hate that idea. Well, let's let's table that discussion. <laughs> the Awkward Agency. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love it. Oh my gosh, Thomas, I really enjoyed our conversation today and listening to the real estate side of things because I mean, as you might have guessed, I have a little bit of a side eye towards real estate agents every once in a while when it comes to the <laughs> when it comes to the insurance aspect of things because my clients, I work hard to develop relationships with my clients that last for years and we touch base with them on a sometimes monthly basis, depending on what's going on with them, but at least an annual basis to look at their their insurance renewals and correct me if I'm wrong. I know realtors want that long-standing relationship as well, but they buy a home maybe once every few years or once every 10 years, unless they're an investor and purchasing properties frequently kind of thing. So the insurance relationship is very, very important. And to have an outsider come in and almost blow up that relationship sometimes when they're like, your insurance person is crazy. Here's my, you know, my mm -hmm. referral for you. Um, it, it tends hmm. to make us a little prickly. So I really appreciate your perspective today. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thomas, let me ask you a quick question. Where do you suggest insurance professionals go to keep themselves updated on real estate information so that it benefits them and their clients? Yeah, Zillow.com. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's really... Wikipedia. <laughs> It, it's really developing a relationship with someone that's local in your market. To, take them out to happy hour. Go go do something extracurricular. Develop a relationship with, with a local realtor. Um, I like that. And that's the best information you're going to get is somebody that's boots on the ground, doing it full time, right? So like right now, I'm fortunate to have eight to 10 clients in contract at the moment. So as far as to get the lay of the land of different locations, different neighborhoods, what's hot, where where are the investment markets located throughout town? It would be 
really just developing a relationship with someone in the industry, uh, real, real estate agent, real estate broker. And this is why technology will never take over because relationships are important and insurance is a relationship-driven business. Boom. <laughs> Boom, mic drop. And my telephone number is 513-314-4141. And my <laughs> email is thomas.rabby at westwoodohio.com if you are in the Columbus, Dayton, or Cincinnati market. I love it. As we wrap up today's episode, I hope you found the keys to understanding how real estate professionals and insurance professionals can work together to provide a rock solid foundation for home buyers and make the process more comfortable for all involved. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us on Awkward Insurance. It's been a pleasure. Toodles, everybody. Bye. Thanks for hanging out and listening to another Awkward Insurance Conversation. If you haven't already, be sure to join the Awkward Insurance Facebook community. We have an amazing group of people on there. And for more episodes, head over to the National Alliance website at scic.com. Now go forth and be awkward. Toodles. Mm, that's awkward. <laughs>